good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. As you know, last week we began reaching out to about 1,000 Vermonters who had reported damage to their heating systems as a result of the floods to check in on how they're doing. With cold weather around the corner, we need to make sure those who haven't been able to make the needed repairs get that help uh, that they need to do that. We need a better understanding of what that includes and what stands between them and a warm home. So far, we've heard back from about one third of those we emailed. And as a reminder, anyone who reported to FEMA or 211 that you had damage to your heating system, you should have received an email from a Vermont.gov address. So please complete the survey if you received it so we can give you a helping hand. Later this week, we'll start making direct calls to anyone we have not heard back from. The calls will come from the tax department, but don't worry. They're not calling to talk about taxes. They've, uh, they've stepped up to help us. Another example of how we work together as one team during a crisis. If you didn't get an email and you still have damage to a heating system, call my office at 828-3333 and we'll get the information we need over the phone. And if you know someone in this situation, ask them if they fill, filled out this short and simple, simple survey or encourage them to check their email or call if not. We're working with many partners, including Efficiency Vermont, the Vermont uh, Fuel Dealers Association, and Vermont Gas. So we can use the surveys to connect te technicians to those who need service and equipment. Again, we know that for some, it's been difficult to find contractors available to repair their furnaces. The Fuel Dealers Association have agreed to help connect people with contractors to get the work done and I want to thank Matt Coda, who is here today, for his teamwork on this. But even after the FEMA awards, we know there are many financial barriers. So Efficiency Vermont will reach out and make flood victims aware of the financial incentives and resources available, including the recent 10 million the e-board approved, which they oversee. Peter Walk from Efficiency Vermont is here with us today to go over some of the programs that are operating right now to help those impacted by flooding. We continue uh, to update you on our progress and how we're working with these partners, but I want to thank them for their collaboration as we work together to make sure Vermonters impacted by the flooding have the heat they need to get through the winter. So with that, I'll turn it over to Peter Walk. Thank you, Governor. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Peter Walk. I'm the Managing Director of Efficiency Vermont. I'm happy to be here today to talk to a little bit about the programs that are available to help Vermonters get back into heating and hot water and other basic appliances uh, before winter comes. Uh, as the Governor mentioned, the Emergency Board took action in late July uh, to repurpose $10 million of existing ARPA funding uh, to support this effort, uh, to support low and moderate income Vermonters uh, getting back into heat and hot water and other basic appliances before winter. Uh, we have been working with the Public Service Department to rapidly deploy these dollars and I'm grateful for the partnership across the board working with our uh, partners across the energy space uh, to be able to get these dollars out. There are three primary components to this program. Uh, there is the $10 million that I mentioned that is focused on residential programs. Those are available to anybody who uh, any family making uh, less than 120% of the area median income, and we have an easy to follow table on our website. Uh, there are programs that are focused on homeowners and tenants, as well as rental property owners. Um, we are offering uh, contacts through uh, Efficiency Vermont's uh, team to do virtual home energy visits, where very simply you can walk around with your smartphone and show us what your heating system, what your weatherization, what other aspects of your sort of energy use look like to be able to uh, to best support you. Uh, those re those rebates are interact with the FEMA process, um, and the the e board uh, saw fit to uh, to maximize that award at, at ten thousand dollars. There's a significant support available to folks. 
Uh, it's available for both primary and supplementary heating systems. So uh, if FEMA was to have helped you get back into your furnace or boiler uh, and you wanted to explore um, getting a heat pump or a pellet stove or another option, that would be available to you uh, as, a, as a rebate. Additionally, uh, through work with the Public Service Department, we were able to secure through the PUC an additional million dollars to support businesses in recovering from the flood. Uh, the businesses are eligible for up to $1,000 per appliance or piece of equipment that they need to replace due to flooding, up to four appliances, so they can receive a max of $4,000. Uh, and additionally, we've been working with the Agency of Natural Resources on a, a program to uh, help uh, to ensure that there is contractor availability, as the governor mentioned, so that we can make sure that everybody uh, is working together because we know that you know many contractors have come in to try to help as much as possible, and uh, they have other business waiting, and so we need to make sure that we get help people get uh, into warm homes for the winter. Uh, I'm uh, grateful for, for the governor and his team to be putting out the survey that they did that will help us understand the, the remaining lay of the land and who needs the support and how we can help them uh, get back into those systems over time. Uh, additionally, there is, um, as part of the grant we worked on with the Public Service Department, and these will extend uh, further into the future, there's $5 million available to help people switch to heat pump hot water heater systems, which can help them save significant money and uh, energy use over the course of time, as well as money to help with electric panel upgrades to allow for the electrification of heating and transportation and other things. Uh, we have been working very closely to deploy, to get those monies out the door with partners, with the other electric, uh, energy efficiency utilities and the distribution utilities to get those monies out the door as quickly as possible. And all of that is on top of the existing incentives that Efficiency Vermont and other partners offer uh, so that people can uh, really uh, have much of those needs met over the course of time. That's weatherization dollars, that's existing incentives for uh, pieces of equipment. Um, and so you can stack those resources on top of that, that they do not, the existing resources and those, that five and that $19 million do not count towards the $10,000 cap. Uh, there are, there, there, you know, we understand that many are on different stages of this journey in terms of recovery. And so there are complicating factors across the board. Uh, the FEMA process, uh, while wonderful and great, and the folks in FEMA have been wonderful to work with, it's complicated and it's a complicated process for an individual. We want to make sure that Vermonters are maximizing the award that they get from FEMA and then the support from us helps to supplement that effort. So make sure you're working through FEMA and your insurance company uh, first and then coming to us to see what additional support that we can provide. Uh, we also know that upfront capital is a problem. And so we're working with partners to try to better understand what that need is and how we can help meet it through existing and expanded loan programs and other ways for folks to be able to access the capital they need so that then the rebates that we offer can come in on the back end. Um, we also know people are struggling. The scale of this challenge is overwhelming and the number of programs that they need to access. So we're, we're here as a resource. We, there are other folks who are acting as a resource. We want people to, to, to be able to uh, work with us however they, they need to. Uh, that's why we're working with community partners to help uh, be an extra layer uh, on top of the trusted partners that are out there. Um, so without, I'm happy to hand it to uh, the general here to talk further about what's going on uh, with FEMA, but I'm happy to answer questions at the end. Hey, good morning. Uh, couple updates for you all. Um, under individual assistance, uh, we are now at $19.8 million that we've been able to provide to uh, approve uh, for uh, Vermonters who uh, requested assistance. Um, uh, we continue to work uh, with Vermont uh, on the deadline. Right now it's October 12th. Um, so we extended it 30 days at the governor's request. Uh, and due to that, an additional 167 people have uh, been able to apply for assistance. Um, <clears throat> and of course, uh, we appreciate your help in putting out the information. You know, uh, if you haven't contacted us yet, please do, do so uh, prior to October 12th at 1-800-621-3362.
We currently have uh, four disaster recovery centers open. We ask people to go there if they've received a letter from FEMA and have questions about it. Uh, that's the primary purpose for them, although they can also register there. Uh, the location we have in Barton will be closing today, uh, relatively slow, uh, low numbers. Uh, that will leave us with Ludlow, Barry, and Waterbury as the three remaining uh, disaster recovery centers. Um, we're also working with the state on public assistance. Um, and so right now we have 183 applicants. Applicant can either be a, a town, city, or a, a private nonprofit. Uh, and based upon those 183 applicants, we've already built out approximately 325 projects. Uh, that's typically based upon providing funding back for funds that are already expended that are eligible for reimbursement or projects that need to be completed. Um, the, uh, the current estimate for the costs, I know there's always interest in that. Right now, our current estimate based upon the damages we've received from our applicants is around $120 million, but it's early. Uh, we continue to work with AOT, one of the, the largest applicants we have, um, as well as working uh, with the state on the state buildings in Montpelier that obviously were impacted. Uh, the governor requested assistance uh, under the Community Disaster Loan Program. Uh, and this is designed for uh, 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 applicants to be able to receive low interest loans uh, while they await funds to come from FEMA. Uh, that has just been approved, and there will be a, a, a conversation between uh, the uh, headquarters, uh, Region 1 and, and uh, Cambridge, uh, and the state uh, on the program uh, to lay the foundation for how that can be executed. Um, and with the extension of the incident uh, period, uh, Franklin County's damages, which occurred on the 21st of, of, uh, of July, are now considered uh, as eligible. However, uh, the facility that was most impacted is, is a, a waste treatment site, and so it's a lot of complications with it there. So we haven't received the determination yet as to whether they'll be qualifying for uh, categories A through G. Uh, along with the other 12 counties. So that's yet to be determined, but we're working very closely with the state on that and hope to have the answer very, very soon. Um, and then uh, just a couple quick stats. You know, we still have 352 people with FEMA on the ground here uh, supporting uh, the state. Um, 5,907 people as of this morning have applied for assistance from FEMA. And uh, for the Small Business Administration, our, our partner uh, agency, uh, they've actually uh, had uh, 394 loans, uh, equating to $21.9 million that they provided for assistance. Um, so that's a quick recap of where we are at, uh, and I look forward to any questions you may have, and I'll turn it over to the governor. Thank you, sir. Now I'll open it up to questions. Governor, with the potential for a governor, government shutdown coming this weekend do you see any need to extend that FEMA deadline once again or do you think October 12th is it? Well regardless of whether they shut down or not uh, we are considering uh, extending it okay. but uh, but haven't made that decision yet but in all likelihood we'll we will extend that. Governor you, you, you talked several times about you know, if there is a government shutdown some of our most immediate needs will still continue to be met by FEMA, but it's more that longer term planning, the long term recovery. Can you just help us understand, and, and maybe um, Recovery Officer Farnham as well, about, or really anybody, of, of what that really looks like? Yeah, well, first of all, um, we still don't know whether it's going to be shut down or not. Uh, we've been through this, uh, we've seen this film a few times, and they always seem to be able to come up with something in the end. Uh, I'm hoping that's the case uh, this time. Um, but if not, uh, we have practiced this drill year after year after year. Um, so we have drawn down all the funds we possibly can uh, to make sure that we can get through this. Um, as well, as we've reported before, due to the ARPA funds and so forth that we've received over the last uh, couple of years, uh, we have a lot of cash on hand. Uh, so we should be able to make it through this without a lot of harm. 
Uh, but I will, um, maybe I'll, oh yeah, there is Doug, have Doug uh, come and supplement anything that I've missed. Um, and as well, maybe while we're on the topic, we'll have uh, General Roy talk about what this means to FEMA as well and to the state. Thank you, Governor. So while FEMA may not be able to obligate in the short term in the event of a shutdown, we will be still be able to work together with FEMA to build the damage inventories and the project workbooks and everything that goes into knowing what our long-term, um, what our permanent work and what our long-term efforts will look like. So, uh, I mean, that is a time-consuming process anyway. So shutdown would have to be extremely long in order to impact that, that long-term planning and recovery process. So we should still be able to move the ball forward uh, potentially without any delay uh, in our, in our long-term recovery efforts. And so when would that money in theory come, as you know, the governor said, we've seen shutdowns before. I think the longest was back in 2019 or so, um, 30 days. So would, would that affect how money flows into Vermont? Uh, not to any significant extent specific to our FEMA on this particular disaster, uh, because generally speaking, it, we can establish an obligation, but then it's still some time before we actually draw down that funding with FEMA. Um, so the we're not at that stage yet where we'd be drawing down funds for most things. We're, we would only at this point be drawing down funds for our emergency response, which fall into the immediate needs category and may still be eligible for drawdown. General Roy can correct me if that's, if that's wrong, but I believe that's the case. Uh, and, and yes, uh, under INF, uh, immediate needs fund, uh, funding, we continue to be able to support uh, Vermont. Um, the only thing that's on hold right now are the, are the funds available for the public assistance uh, program. Uh, but we are, as I said, we're really, really early in that, uh, in that stage. Um, we haven't yet in projects yet to actually be obligated. Uh, so we're in a good place. All the personnel we have deployed will continue to stay. Um, they are paid out of the dis disaster relief fund, uh, which continues to have funds in it and available for us to continue our operations. Thanks. There. Yes, ma'am. Um, can you tell us at this point how many households have been identified as eligible in FEMA temporary housing and also how many are interested? Sure. In that? Uh, we have around 240 ish uh, that were, uh, have reached out to uh, that qualify either for destroyed homes or, or substantially damaged. And of those, the initial population that expressed interest was 54. I think we're down to 43. Um, and as you recall, we talked about the fact that the longer it takes to find a housing solution or for FEMA to set up the housing for them, you know, the population, they find, they find their own path along the way. Um, that certainly doesn't impact our ability, our desire to continue to move forward as we will. Uh, it's just, you know, it's, we see it time after time after time. Are you keeping tabs on, I mean, we're talking about like a dozen people here, but mm -hmm. like, where those people are going? Are they actually communicating with FEMA? We're going to family, or we're moving out of state, or what that means? Sure. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. As as so for the population of the 54 we started with, um, you know, the, if they, you know, when we they call us and say, hey, I no longer want to be in the direct housing. I found a, a, a rental place that's going to work for me, uh, or I've made a life choice to go somewhere else. Um, uh, so they, they provide feedback, and and then. Beyond that, of the 200 and some odd that we had reached out to, they have the opportunity to, to change your mind as well. If they thought they were in a good place and all of a sudden they're not, they can come back and say, "Hey, um, you know, circumstances changed, and so we uh, we're going to need some assistance." Okay. Thank, you. Okay. Thank you. Going back to talking about heat with how you started off um, today, I guess how are you going to be working with? Dealers Association. What does that partnership look like? I guess it's just making sure that there are going to be the numbers to get these people their heat sources by winter. Well, this survey will tell us a lot uh, about those who are impacted, those who are waiting. Um, I think we've heard back again from about a third, and about half of that third uh, have said that they're all set, but the other half have uh, have some questions about whether they're 
uh, in the process or they just can't find anybody. So that's what we're trying to determine. And if we, w when we have that number, we'll be, we'll be conferring uh, with both Efficiency Vermont and the Fuel Dealers Association, and they've agreed to try and put people together uh, so that we, we know of a contractor who might be available, a fuel dealer out there who might be able to help uh, get these people uh, the heat they need to get through the winter. So we don't have all the information yet, but that's what we're driving at. We, we know we want to get those people connected um, and determine whether if it's a financial need that they have, we'll put them in touch with people that, who can help them. Um, any way we can do, anything we can do uh, to bridge that gap is what we're, that's our mission. Are you worried at all about the response to the survey so far? Mm -hmm. And when will you guys start directly reaching out? We'll, we'll start directly reaching out now, um, as soon as we, we know we get, I mean, I think having a, a third um, respond uh, immediately, uh, I think that's good. Um, we're hoping that those who haven't received uh, the email, or maybe they don't have service now, who knows, and are listening to this and reading and listening to your reports, will reach out to us, 828-3333, uh, so that we can help them right here through the governor's office. Along the same, similar lines, Peter, um, I have a question for you, and it's admittedly a pretty subjective question. There were obviously lots of people in Vermont pre-flood who were interested in upgrading their home heating systems. I can imagine that a lot of people, if they weren't flooded out, maybe feel guilty about coming forward and wanting to pursue upgrades to their home. Do you have any advice for folks that, like, should they continue or should they maybe wait a year? What do you think? Uh, for folks who are flood impacted or those who not are flood not in flood impacted? I think people need to make the choices that they want to make on the timeline that they need to make them. Obviously, we want to make sure that we have the contractor supply to be able to help those who need to be able to respond from the flood. Uh, but you know, people people have the opportunity to save money and save energy and make the the choices that they want to make. Now, uh, those those windows often are finite, and so they should take advantage of them while they can. And if they can get the support, then they should move forward. Okay. Maybe it's for the governor too. How how is that workforce question looking? A few weeks ago, you mentioned that you were setting up a statewide, or we already have a registry. You called on others to say, "Hey, pit, pitch in." Where where do we stand, and how confident are you about the the heat HVAC workforce? Well, I'm I'm concerned, obviously, about our workforce in general. It's something I've been concerned about for quite some time, and uh, this the flooding. Uh, uh, event has impacted that. Um, so, and we're getting uh, towards winter now. The, the temperature is dropping. And uh, so, yeah, I'm concerned. Uh, and that's why we reached out, and that's why we have the survey and reached out to the Fuel Dealers Association and others to make sure that we can. Uh, there may be areas of the state uh, who weren't impacted that may have capacity, and we just need to link them up with those in the areas that were impacted. Uh, so that they can uh, they can help out, and I and I will see um, how this goes, and if uh, if we can do this with all in-state resources, that's great. Um, but if we need to, if we see that we're overwhelmed and, and don't have the capacity in-state, we'll we'll use other utilize other measures and look outside the state. Got a few folks online and come back to the room. Um, we'll start with Ed Barber from Port Daily Express. Yeah, hello, can you hear me? We can. Okay, my question actually is going to be for um, uh, Anson Tebbets. I was just wondering if there has been any type of a preliminary update on the uh, crop damage that came about from the uh, late frost in the springtime and then the uh, heavy floods in July. And are there programs out there that people can still access to help them with their loss? Hanson, are you on the line? Uh, thank you, Ed. Okay. Yes, I'm here, Governor. Uh, Ed, uh, yes, a, a couple of uh, updates. Uh, we did do a survey uh, that went out, uh, and it's been concluded about two weeks ago we released it. We think um, about $17 million in impact damage uh, across the board to the severe weather this summer. 
also uh, um, about 27,000 acres uh, impacted. Um, so there is a program out there. We are encouraging people. Uh, they can go through the BGAP program. Uh, farmers are eligible for that. Uh, we are getting applications uh, from farmers uh, and they are qualifying for those uh, relief dollars there. So that is one avenue. Also, uh, the Vermont Community Foundation uh, has a granting program for farmers and producers. Uh, they are taking applications as well. We have someone from the agency that's helping with that. Uh, so those are the, the couple of relief programs. Also, with the designation of the um, uh, uh, disaster declaration granted by USDA, it is uh, freeing up some relief programs. Uh, they're not direct payments, but there are some emergency loan programs uh, that are available out there. As far as the current climate out there now, I think um, it's hit or miss on some of your your own operations. I was at one over the weekend, and they're managing it nicely. Uh, there are apples out there for folks. If people are um, nervous about showing up and thinking there may not be apples, for the most part, there are apples for pick your own operations. Uh, same with pumpkins. And many of these uh, farms have uh, social media channels and they can, they can uh, get a, an update with them. They're just managing them a little differently because of the hard frost. But for the most part, I think people are encouraged and we've got some great weather this week. A lot of work's being done in the field right now. A lot of hay, a lot of corn that's being uh, harvested. So we, uh, we're encouraged at least by the weather over the last few days and going into the weekend. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Have a nice day. Keith, Rotten Herald. Uh, hi. Um, so I heard today that uh, Mackenzie Scott, I believe, had donated, I think, I want to say $20 million to the Champlain Housing Trust, and that's obviously very good news, but I'm also just kind of curious if that has caused anyone to rethink how they might want to allocate other resources in the state if they, if they got such a large infusion. Has anybody rethought how... Um, where other monies might go, or if it's just uh, um, more, I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, yeah, no. Um, this was somewhat news, uh, at least to me, uh, maybe to us in general. Uh, this is great news, and uh, we're very thankful for the injection of resources uh, to help in our housing crisis. And Champlain Trust is a, a great, viable uh, organization that, that can put the money to work. Um, so we'll we'll contemplate this, but at this point in time, that isn't our first reaction. It's not whatever amount of money that we put forth uh, thus far, which has been uh, a tremendous amount, is not enough. Um, so this is uh, again, uh, we'll supplement a lot of uh, areas, and we'll uh, we'll continue to to um, to advocate for more housing in strategic ways. Um, so. Good news, uh, and we'll contemplate what this means uh, to our overall program, but it's just too early to tell. Thank you. Tim McQuiston, uh, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. I was wondering if, there, if you have an update on the BGAP program now that you've uh, expanded it, and it's been a week or so since that happened, if there's been much activity on that front. I, if you're talking about new applications, uh, I don't have that information, but maybe Secretary Curley might be on, or Commissioner Goldstein. I'll just look up. Secretary Curley is testifying at the Joint Fiscal okay. Committee right now. Okay. We can get that to you, Tim. Okay, that, that'd be great. Just, you know, just to get an update of how things are progressing. Appreciate it. And just, to, you, just to be clear, uh, those who are in the program now that have uh, had applied and received uh, funding uh, don't need to do anything. Uh, we'll be just um, updating their application and sending them a check uh, for that difference. Tom 
Tom, it looks like you might be muted. All right, we'll go back to the room. General, I don't know if you had any update on the Old Country Club site. Uh, I know last week the city council had just kind of agreed to it, so I don't know if there was any update. Um, well, we've got uh, some schematics we're working on. Um, we are sharing that uh, with our head, uh, with FEMA headquarters, uh, taking a look at how we can best utilize it. Um, I think there's a follow-on meeting uh, this evening, uh, I think, with the, the council as well. Um, and so uh, we aren't in a lease yet, uh, but we anticipate we're getting very close to that. Are Thanks. there updates on other locations for converting that the, the only uh, other locations we found so far, uh, there's one in Springfield, uh, which has a, a number of sites. Um, uh, and, you know, as part of our, our outreach to folks uh, in a direct housing uh, pool, uh, we do offer them uh, sites that are available. So even if they live in Lamoille County or Washington, you know, we'll ask them, hey, if you're mobile and you are willing to move, we can place a site down there. Right now, there hasn't been any desire to do so, uh, but they're not compelled to do that. Um, so we, we try to keep them within, you know, half an hour of, of their disaster home. You mentioned these right now are approved up to 18 months. What happens in the meantime if you're in one for six months, you find permanent housing? What What is the future of, of that housing unit? Who gets that? Um, so there are a number of options. Um, we can either pull back and put it into our inventory, uh, or uh, they can, if the states approach us, they can potentially be uh, purchased or donated. Uh, so there's a number of different avenues to, to go down. Um, uh, they, you know, they take waivers, uh, uh, and so we work with the state and, and FEMA headquarters as to, you know, the best disposition. Obviously, the best thing for us to do is to, you know, versus having to move them again. Uh, if there's an opportunity for the state to have them, uh, we look at that, uh, should the state desire to do so. And people don't pay rent on these, correct? Uh, so while they are uh, in the direct housing, that's a good question. Uh, that, that's correct. So my phone a friend is here, and the answer is no. Do they pay utilities? Uh, I, nope. Nope. Okay. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks, Sam. And the state is interested in those units. Noted, sir. Uh, back to the Mackenzie Scott donation. Do, is, is there a particular way you hope to see that money spent? Well, I think it's in good hands, obviously, with the Champlain Trust. Uh, so we will um, we will give advice along the way, um, but um, but I'm sure they'll put it to good use. No. Housing Trust just took a hold of the new low barrier shelter uh, in Burlington. Uh, some money going in to fix that. So, do you think that's a good use of some of that? Money? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, increasing shelter capacity is going to be key, I believe. This is admittedly news to me, but I just saw that Vermont Public reported that your administration is seeking to keep spending increases next year to no more than 3%. Um, Given the rate of inflation and just the direction of things right now, how do you see that playing out? Well, again, we I think the legislature went above and beyond uh, the last go-around, 13% uh, increase in spending. Uh, we had advocated for eight or nine, so uh, I continue to be concerned about uh, Vermonters' ability to pay and making Vermont more affordable and spending increases of 13% uh, just don't meet the mark, and we need to do whatever we can. Now, uh, we haven't uh, provided any, we want to keep it as low as possible. We have to set a, a benchmark in order to do that, uh, but we'll see where we go. We, we haven't even begun our budget process. Okay. Do you see cuts needing to be made anywhere? We haven't begun our budget process, but we are always, uh, willing to do whatever we can uh, to to make sure we present a budget that is uh, feasible for Vermonters and their ability to pay. Um, is the state planning on implementing any hiring freezes for state workers or, you know, COLA freezes? We, we can't fill the positions we have, right? I mean, we have 10% vacancy right now. Uh, so um, we, we are going to continue to try and hire 
uh, even if, it, and I'm not saying there is, we haven't even contemplated that, but we still need people to fill positions that are critical. Do you have any sense of what the federal match will be with some of the FEMA funds? I know it depends on the pot of money, and that's probably going to wind down from some state state funds. What, what do we know about the federal match? That we'll well, the federal match at this point in time is 25%. Um, we're, if we hit, hit a certain threshold, I think it's 111, yes, sir. 111 million, uh, then we go to 10%. I, I feel as though that's going to be an easy mark, easy threshold to exceed. So I believe we're going to be at the 10%. Uh, I know uh, Senator Sanders has advocated for uh, no match, but um, but I'm not sure. I don't I don't know if that's feasible or not. But we will, if he's able to do that, that'd be great. Um, but uh, but I believe it'll be 10 percent. Anything I should add to that, Doug? I would say that there are some. There are just a few programs that have that stay at the 25 percent. But from a financial perspective, the the vast majority will be in that 10 percent match category. And then for municipalities, we have the, emer the Emergency Relief Assistance Fund, the ERAF fund. And so then they don't pay that full 10% based on their planning status and other factors. They pay a part of that 10%, and the state pays part of it. So I think we're, we have a lot to figure out the match situation, but I would agree with the governor that that 90% threshold should be easy to cross. However, it won't be crossed officially for for a little bit more time because it relies on the obligation with FEMA, and that's a, a process that we have to go through still. So you don't have any sense of what that number, that match could be as of yet? Um, I, I, the only thing I would say at this time is that in general, uh, the amount of damage, the amount of resilience work we want to do, this is on the same size and scope as Irene. So. Um, I think it's in that same ballpark, but beyond that general statement, I don't think I have more detail. Governor, you had mentioned weeks ago at this point um, working with the congressional delegation to get some special appropriations, particularly for the north end of Barrie. Do you have any updates? On no that? updates at this point. I, I think they're trying to get a budget passed at this, at this juncture, um, but uh, that's still on the table, hopefully. back to Congress in the budget. Um, I'm not really sure how best to phrase it, but what, what do you make of what's happening right now in the House of Representatives among the GOP and, and the infighting that's happening? Yeah, I think it's unfortunate, obviously. Um, but we've seen this type of thing building over time. Uh, and it's not unusual, uh, at least in the last decade, uh, to see the, the threats of shutting the government down. Um, and maybe over the last couple of decades, but it's, it's become increasingly more difficult in some respects because of the close numbers. Uh, and, and so we'll see how it all plays out. Uh, but um, you know, nobody's asked my advice, but I would find uh, those moderate centrists in the middle of both parties and figure out a way to make it happen. All right, thank you all.